Jamie Jacobs, uh, Jamie Jacob, and um, uh, Victoria and Natale have been visiting us from Oklahoma State University this week, and uh, we've been doing a lot of work and trying to use their UAS data to evaluate the high-resolution simulations we've been doing with uh, the Wharf LES system. And so um, it's my pleasure to introduce Jamie. He's the um, chair of the Aerospace Engineering Department at Oklahoma State University. He's also the, um, the director of the Unmanned Systems Research Institute at Oklahoma State. And he'll be talking today about CloudMap, um, which is he's the lead PI on this NSF-funded project. And so we'll get a lot of information about what this project is. Great. Thank you very much. Over, so I appreciate that. So I think we're good on the... Yeah, turn it off. Oh, that would probably help. Huh? All right, are you good now? Okay, good. Thank you very much. And thanks, uh, James, for the introduction and uh, particularly the invite out here. Uh, Victoria and I have a, had a really productive week and really appreciate all the meetings that you've set up for us. And it's been very useful from our perspective. Uh, went by too fast, and hopefully we can come back uh, you know, in the near future and be able to do this uh, again. So as James mentioned, uh, what I'll we'll primarily be talking about is a cloud map. Um, so small unmanned aircraft systems for atmospheric boundary layer observation. So there are a lot of acronyms on this title. One of those is CloudMap, which is, uh, stands for Collaboration Leading Operational Unmanned Development for Meteorology and Atmospheric Physics. And that was a lot of words to stick on the title. So I use the acronyms instead. Um, this is a multi-investigator project. There are a lot of PIs as well as a lot of students working on this. So I certainly want to make sure I give kudos uh, to all of those uh, students and investigators who provided um, all the hard work you know, to make this project successful. Um, so before I get started, um, you know, I've been pretty enthralled uh, with this uh, during the week. So I always think that, you know, things like this really puts things in perspective uh, when we kind of go through our, our daily grind and you know, makes us seem pretty small and ins insignificant, uh, but it's pretty amazing, uh, I think, just from not only the image, but also the scale of this uh, when you start to think about it. Uh, so as James mentioned, I'm from Oklahoma uh, State University. Uh, so from Oklahoma, we're all, you know, of course, the land of uh, tornadoes, uh, but we also have our own set of mountains out there as well. So it's really nice being out here in the foothills of the, uh, uh, the Rockies, uh, this is what we call a mountain in Oklahoma, and that looks really impressive uh, until you actually start to look at the scale of that, and that's about 200 feet high. Um, and so that's about as, you know, as big as we typically get, uh, minus a couple of things, and, you know, the, uh, the Arbuckles, you know, which are the oldest mountain range within the uh, U.S., uh, but have been worn down over time. Uh, this image is actually one that Victoria took uh, using photogrammetry. And so even that's one of the things that we will not talk about very much uh, today in the presentation. One of the things that we have been working on is really linking up the impacts of terrain on uh, ABL physics. So how are those systems coupled, uh, both in terms of things such as the vegetative coupling uh, for you know, CO2 fluxes uh, at the surface, as well as impact of the terrain on things such as uh, the turbulent boundary layer. Uh, so these have been just some of the aspects of the projects that we've been working on, uh, but primarily we're gonna be focused really on the systems today and what we've been using those for to try to bring those to maturity to get to the point where we can use these as really kind of daily observation and measurement tools. Now, this is not my first visit to NCAR. Uh, we were out here a couple years ago for an EOL UAS uh, workshop. And the focus there was to start looking at SUAS, again, small unmanned aircraft systems, as a tool. You know, what would that uh, ELL inventory look like in terms of being able to, you know, check out systems and capabilities uh, to add to the manned aircraft uh, fleet? And, and you know, the kind of end takeaway uh, from this is, well, there's still a lot more work that needs to be done. Uh, things have really come pretty far in the last couple of years, but we still have a long way uh, to go. And even going back farther, my original uh, involvement on this uh, goes back to when I was an undergraduate student at University of Oklahoma uh, within the Aerospace Engineering Department. And uh, one of the faculty there, uh, uh, Professor Carl Berge, uh, started working on a project with NSSL, uh, Eric Rasmussen, um, and also uh, Brian Argro, who was an assistant professor in uh, the department at the time, who many of you know is now at UC Boulder, uh, chair of the Aerospace Sciences Department. 
Uh, but the idea, of course, was to develop you know, these remote control aircraft. They weren't even called unmanned aircraft systems at that time. Uh, really, you know, no more than hobbyist systems and be able to equip it with sensors to, you know, fly it in or near a developing um, uh, severe uh, thunderstorm or supercell. Um, the idea, you know, was ahead of its time. The technology was not there yet. And it was essentially shelved, you know, for about 10 or 15 years uh, before Brian Argo started to pick that back up uh, in, say, the mid-2000s or so uh, after he moved to uh, UC Boulder. Um, so that technology has come a long way since then, but, you know, we're still not to the point now in terms of developing a system uh, that, you know, still has that vision to be able to even uh, fly in or ne near a tornado. Uh, now, our focus here is really on the ABL. And uh, kind of borrow this uh, slide from uh, Steve Koch, uh, director of, uh, former director of NSSL, uh, to look at the evolution of the atmospheric boundary layer you know, within that lower portion. And if we kind of look at where we would like to be at, it's kind of measuring this stuff up near the cap. And so this kind of, uh, you know, near the, uh, um, the, the lifting level, around 5,000 feet or so, uh, a mile up in the atmosphere, to be able to really get lots of good data um, within that uh, lower region as it evolves over time. Now, right now, we're, we're primarily limited to two tools that we use regularly, uh, one of those being towers, which are obviously you know, great in terms of monitoring what's going on at the surface, and the other are, of course, radio sons or weather balloons that we launch you know, typically twice a day, and they traverse through this portion of the atmosphere very, very quickly. So we end up with a really sparsely sampled data set uh, both spatially and temporarily uh, within the ABL itself. So what we'd like to be able to do is not replace any of these systems that we're currently using, but augment them with another tool, primarily, you know, these small unmanned aircraft systems, uh, which range from, you know, things that we would essentially buy off the shelf somewhere uh, to much, much larger systems that are, you know, somewhere between, you know, what we consider these hobby level systems and, you know, a manned aircraft still capable of uh, carrying very, very large payloads and uh, be able to fly through significant portions of the atmosphere for long periods of time. And the obvious benefit of these systems to studying the atmospheric boundary layer is their ability to traverse through this region very easily. This is where they were designed to fly in. Um, so it's just a matter of getting the systems uh, accelerated in terms of their capability enough to be able to fly up to this 5,000-foot uh, layer, uh, give or take. Um, now, going back to kind of comparisons of where we're at right now, you know, you're using primarily tower technology and weather balloons. This is where we might be at in terms of sampling. Obviously, this is a great interest to the modelers in terms of being able to develop a lot more data points or observations within this period. So what we'd like to be able to do is take the systems, you know, develop them, integrate the sensors, and be confident in the data that we're getting off of those. So that way we end up with abundant sampling within the atmospheric boundary layer. So get lots of data. So what I'll be talking about primarily is uh, development of the systems, uh, a little bit about the, the sensors, and primarily where we're at uh, with, uh, with measurements. So uh, they're across the, the partners through the four universities that we have, uh, there have been a, a focus on a number of different technologies, uh, both in terms of the platforms. You'll notice they're both rotary wing and fixed wing systems on here. Each one of those systems have those advantages really those rotary wing systems in terms of being able to profile the atmosphere, uh, do something very similar to what, what a weather balloon is currently doing, but be able to return to the ground so you get your sensors back in this case. And then of course fixed wing systems which have the capability to fly much longer uh, durations but also much farther and typically much higher as well in terms of being able to get the measurements that you need. So the, the diagnost uh, diagnostics have been a big piece of this. Uh, in terms of both taking instrumentation uh, that we've used in other manned aircraft uh, as well as um, wind tunnels and ground systems and incorporating those into different uh, uh, small unmanned aircraft systems. So there have been a development uh, on a number of fronts in terms of these systems themselves hot wires and multi-hole probes for measurement of turbulence quantities, uh, and those have been very successful. 
and then you know uh, attaching things to rotary wing solutions such as the one shown here which is just the standard uh, ultrasonic uh, anemometer you know, that you would typically use on a tower but attaching that to the system now for each of these integrations we have to start to think about the issues related to the surrounding airflow that's generated by the inflow and the downwash uh, each one of the systems obviously is going to you know be generating a, a thrust through its propulsion system as well as other integration concerns with that so what is the impact of mounting the system to these vehicles and as we go through its operational profile how confident are we that the measurements that we're seeing are going to be accurate so that way when reporting them both in terms of you know for forecasting or for predictive capabilities what is our confidence level uh, in what we're seeing could I ask you to oh, go back and, sure. and define IMU? Oh, yeah, so it's inertial measurement unit. Uh, so uh, it just a, since I won't be going into a lot of detail uh, about the systems themselves, since we're covering a lot of uh, ground here, um, you know, typically when we talk about a small unmanned aircraft system, there are lots of components to that. Primarily, we have this navigational component, which leaks the GPS system uh, with the inertial measurement unit on board the aircraft which has things such as uh, accelerometers and rate gyros, which allows the vehicle to know what its attitude is. So we can take a lot of that info in and then feed that back into the data itself as well. Uh, so that becomes not only useful, but in many cases required. Uh, a good example is this anemometer right here. Um, for, uh, if this aircraft, let's say we want to hold a position, and so we want to measure a certain wind at a given altitude. Let's just say we take it up to 1,000 feet and we just leave it there and let it sit. Um, as the wind changes velocity at that altitude, the aircraft actually has to change its orientation in order to maintain that position. Uh, otherwise, it would drift off uh, along with the wind. So that is going to affect the components that you're getting off of the system itself. So you have to be able to correct for those. That requires that we know what the attitude of the aircraft is and that we're recording that synced up with the data coming off the uh, anemometer as well. So pretty much any wind sensing system, and that'll be one of the focuses that I'll talk about today, um, we have to you know, know that uh, aircraft state as well. So we have to be able to output all the state vectors uh, of the aircraft as well as all the meteorological parameters that we're measuring uh, from the system. Okay, and That's true for both rotary wing systems as well as fixed wing systems here. Uh, mounting you know one of the five-hole probes you, which you can see right here this is one of the University of, of Kentucky's vehicles um, to be able to get accurate wind measurements off of that uh, and this is one of Sean Bailey systems and he's been using this with uh, sending the, these data sets to, to James uh, for a lot of his runs. Uh, you have to be able to know what that uh, orientation is in real time as you're making those measurements. And again, please feel free to ask any questions uh, as we go through the presentation. Um, now, a couple of highlights. Uh, we started this program in, uh, in late 2015, uh, and one of the big elements of this was having an annual flight campaign. What we did not want to have happen was have this technology development be siloed through all the respective laboratories. We wanted to make sure that the, the engineers and the physicists and the meteorologists were all getting together and evaluating this in an annual fashion, not only to see what technology worked, but also to look at this from an operational standpoint. If you want to be able to hand this to a meteorologist in the future and say, here, go take measurements with it, you have to know how well this stuff is going to operate out in the field. Uh, to be able to determine whether this is going to be a useful tool or not uh, for the uh, meteorological community. Uh, so we've had a number of uh, uh, field campaigns, and again, these have primarily been uh, to look at evaluation of different systems, both how well they worked and also the uh, logistical footprint. And then we had a number of targeted opportunities, the Eclipse being one of those. Uh, so we were able to, you know, um, uh, since the, uh, the, the path of totality was conveniently located, 
uh, both in Nebraska and Kentucky, uh, and as well as coordinating with our uh, NOAA partners out of Tennessee and comparing all those measurements uh, uh, along the path. And then a number of targeted uh, uh, opportunities, which has primarily been focused at high wind observations, really pushing the limits of these vehicles. You know, these systems have been designed to operate in these conditions, as well as uh, local severe storms as these things uh, essentially cropped up. So here's an example uh, from uh, both the 2016 and 2017 flight campaigns. You can see we had a relatively large group uh, uh, for both of those campaigns with a number of different uh, platforms. Um, you also see that our focus is primarily these small unmanned aircraft systems. What do I mean by small? Well, the FAA defines that as anything less than 55 pounds. Typically, we're operating around you know, 25 to 35 pounds at the maximum, although we do have larger vehicles, uh, both at that 55 pound limit and above that we you know, use for selected uh, uh, campaigns. But the focus here is really to have these small systems. Yes? Is that both for fixed and rotary? Yes, both for fixed and rotary. So yeah, so you know, we even have some large rotary wing systems that are over 55 pounds as well, uh, not shown on here, but are primarily used to carry you know, uh, um, um, radar instrumentation and other communication instrumentation up to higher altitudes. So these systems do exist, although that's not really the focus of our project uh, for you know, what we're doing right here, because it becomes, again, a, a large uh, logistical hurdle you know, for a lot of researchers to, to overcome uh, in that regard. So for all these field, campa uh, field campaigns, um, we're primarily focused on taking these systems out into the field uh, evaluating them with some, you know, known uh, validation data. So that way, you know, we know what we're getting uh, is, uh, is useful. And then comparing those systems both operationally and how well they work in terms of getting the data that we're looking for uh, for each one of those. So here's some uh, quick examples from both of these. These are uh, primarily thermodynamic observations. And what you'll see here are comparisons from uh, three different platform sets. Um, we have a fixed wing, you know, two larger rotary wing, and one smaller rotary wing system, uh, all primarily carrying you know, PTU sensors of different uh, flavors on board, and then looking at the evolution of that lower level boundary layer uh, throughout the day from zero to about 300 meters or so. Um, now, it's kind of worthwhile at this point to talk about the limitations that we're, we're under. All these vehicles are required to operate and obey you know, FAA regulations, just like any other manned aircraft. So the current limitation for that, per the FAA guidelines, is 400 feet, so, which is pretty low, and from you know, most meteorological perspectives, not really you know, that useful. Um, so we you know, obviously want to be able to, to push that limit. So what you'll notice on here are a couple of these systems are really picking out at about 130 meters, which is that 400 foot limit. And then you have some other systems that are flying up higher. So in these cases, we have to get individual permissions for each one of these systems to be able to allow them to operate outside of this mandated uh, 400 foot limit. Okay, so you'll see kind of comparisons between those uh, as we go throughout the process. The FAA has really come a long way in terms of opening up the airspace and allowing these systems to be able to put, be pushed uh, you know, beyond that 400-foot uh, boundary. And I'll talk about a, a little of those aspects later in the presentation as well. Yes? So you, you mentioned 55 pounds was kind of the small. Yes. Does that have any... Uh, uh, connection with the FAA? It, it, it does. So again, they, so under what they call the Part 107 operating rules, it is less than 55 pounds and lower than 400 feet. Okay. Uh, so those are their primary guidelines that they provide. So if you have a bigger, heavier than that, are you yes. allowed to fly? You, again, you have to get a waiver. Oh, okay. So you have to go through the process just like you would do for an altitude. Uh, you would have to be able to request the FAA to say, yeah, we are following these special uh, provisions, put in your request, and the FAA will then, you know, give thumbs up or thumbs down. Yes, Jim. There seems to be a systematic deviation between the cases where you got special permission and the cases where you were below 400 feet. Yeah, and so what you'll notice that is a particular system, right? And so that comes back to the issue of when you're looking at, so all of these above uh, 400 feet are from a particular platform. I'm talking about the systematic deviation between 
the data, for example, if you move your cursor to the right, the box yeah. black data points and the red data points. And sure. And all of them have the same systematic deviation. Yeah, again, that's part, they're, they're coming from different platforms. Okay. So again, you do have a bias from one platform versus the other platform. And again, you know, these are left in here uh, specifically to illustrate that you do have to take that into consideration. So it's not just calibrated in individual sensors. Even if you have the same sensor that's been calibrated in uh, the chamber, you put them on different aircraft, those aircraft are gonna have individual effects that may bias those sens sensors in one way or another. So it's very important that you take those into account as you're going through the process. Okay, I'm, I'm, and I'm glad you pointed that out. So that's a good observation there, and probably really one of the better takeaways uh, from this slide. Okay, so related to that, following up, so this is a kind of going into that in a little more detail uh, as an example. First off, on, on the left-hand side, uh, you'll notice what we have here uh, is both temperature and humidity maps uh, versus time uh, with altitude uh, going up to 300 uh, meters. So again, this you know, allows us to, again, go beyond that 400 foot uh, limit. And what you'll notice is the evolution of that early morning boundary layer. And it's a great way uh, to visualize that. You know, it's almost what I'd consider CFD you know, quality type of data and be able to say, oh, look, we can see what's really happening uh, to the boundary layer uh, throughout its early morning era evolution. So you can see sunrise here, um, you know, about uh, uh, 11.30 a.m. or so uh, UTC and start to see that boundary layer, you know, quickly evolve uh, throughout that morning period. Uh, so with uh, temperature here, and then humidity down here. Now, these were um, acquired primarily by using uh, a rotary wing vehicle performing uh, profiles. So a vehicle at you know, every 15 minute intervals, flying up, traversing through this region, and then flying back down. And so you can see this data over here from one of those examples of one of those profiles, uh, you know, taking off uh, at the ground and then flying up to 300 feet and then coming back down. And this is using four different sensors to be able to provide redundancy between each one of those. Now what you'll notice between the ascent and the descent is there's a three degree Celsius variation, which is significant, obviously, in terms of what those sensors are actually picking up. And this was really our first clue that you know, the uh, surrounding flow field um, you know, being generated by the prop wash, both the inflow and the outflow of those systems had a much larger impact on these sensors than we would have expected. Uh, and so this was a little bit of a surprise to us. We thought it was gonna be a little easier. I mean, we were naive in this, uh, this sense to be able to say we throw the sensors on and what we get is what we get. So this again goes back to that point in terms of being able to say, yeah, you're gonna see differences not only from vehicle to vehicle, but also on the vehicle itself, depending on how that vehicle is operating, okay? And this is primarily due to the fact that as the vehicle is ascending, um, its downwash is significantly different from as the vehicle is descending, okay? And primarily not due to any uh, internal heating on the vehicle, but you can have those effects as well. So, you know, we could just, you know, t uh, talk at uh, infinitum really about uh, these effects alone. So one of the ways that we deal with this is through, you know, relatively uh, simplistic calibrations. You know, it's fairly uh, expensive to be able to develop a full calibration chamber that would be able to handle these size of vehicles, particularly during its operating mode, because that's one of the issues illustrated by this test, is we have to be able to look at these through operating uh, uh, configuration. So rather than just, you know, sitting on the bench, and so, you know, our, our tests are uh, performed. What you'll notice here is we have a, a calibration truck sitting outside um, our air conditioned building, and then we have also one sitting on the inside of this. Open up the door, so we have a set of conditions on one side, a set of conditions on the other side, and then we essentially fly through this shock, uh, much like this, <coughs> flying the vehicle in its flight configuration, you know, trying to match what the vehicle would actually uh, see under as realistic conditions as we uh, possibly can. And then you end up seeing something uh, uh, similar uh, to this. And so this is actually comparing two different sensor sets now. Uh, we have both a slow and a fast response uh, relative humidity sensor. So this is looking at the temperature and then the relative humidity uh, between both of those 
as you're passing essentially through the shock from, whoops, sorry, one side to the other side of those uh, validation data sets and uh, compare uh, both of those. Now this does illustrate one of the other issues that you run into. You'll notice we're traversing through the shock relatively quickly, but the time response of the sensors you know, do um, uh, show uh, that they do take a little bit of time uh, to be able to come to those equilibrium uh, conditions on one side or the other. Um, notice that this is actually a, a, a false spike here due to the fact that this relative humidity sensor is using temperature uh, as the input. So those of you familiar with relatively, relative humidity sensors uh, would probably recognize that. So this is just one of the examples, you know, the things that you have to go through the process of, of dealing with. Um, so then we'll, once we uh, kind of go through this process, then we'll take this, uh, the systems out and perform field uh, validation. Uh, those have primarily been at um, the Mesonet sites uh, located around the state, uh, as well as the DOE ARM SGP site uh, located in northern Oklahoma. And for the example I'll talk about later this morning through lapse rate, uh, you know, using the, the Merck system. And these have been you know, compared with a number of different uh, towers, uh, shown one of the mesonet sites here, uh, mobile mesonets, uh, as well as ground light, LIDARs, and I'll show some examples of that data as well, uh, through different boundary layer conditions, so that way we would have, you know, be able to develop some level of confidence uh, with how well these systems are actually picking up the measurements. So here's an example. So this is uh, um, the wind uh, data from a scanning Doppler LIDAR located at uh, University of Oklahoma's uh, Kessler Atmospheric Environmental Field Station. Uh, this is uh, from, uh, from Petra Klein. And so you'll notice here again, x-axis is our, is our time, and then we have height. This is typically getting good data up to about 1,500 um, uh, meters uh, or so. And so you can see both wind speed and wind direction here. Now this happened to occur during one of our 24-hour IOPs. Uh, so we were running through you know, that 24-hour period, both the OU and the OSU teams launching vehicles uh, roughly every half hour or so to be able to evaluate them and compare them against the uh, um, LIDAR system to see how well they were picking up winds aloft. Uh, what you will notice here is we end up having this low-level high-speed jet move through through the early morning hours. Um, so about 25 meters per second, uh, around uh, 500 meters or so. Um, so that was not expected, but that actually worked out really well, because uh, in terms of our uh, evaluation, we were able to determine what worked and what didn't work. So this is actually an example uh, from a, a one of the rotary wing vehicles uh, uh, performing profiles. You'll notice you know, we're, our, our goal was really to be able to develop these maps, so you end up having this uh, capability that we previously did not have in order to be able to map this ABL uh, and be able to provide this rich tapestry of you know, what's happening with both thermodynamic and, and kinematic parameters within the lower ABL. Um, you will notice a couple things. We had dropouts here. Uh, these are primarily because we have to operate under VMC, uh, so visual meteorological conditions. So as we see other manned aircraft flying through the area, we have to land. And so we're not able to essentially get data. In both these cases, we were ascending and then aircraft comes through and we essentially have to land and then we have that, you know, that data drop out for that particular uh, uh, case. Um, you'll notice the rest of the day, we end up with really nice data sets up until through this region, we have uh, wind speeds over 20 meters per second and the vehicle essentially meets its operating limitations. Uh, so we had multiple vehicles that were flying. Some of them were able to traverse up higher through this region, but this provides a really nice example of some of those limitations that we're currently at right now in terms of uh, pushing the limits on the systems. Uh, this was a rotary wing system. We actually had some fixed wing platforms that were flying uh, within this region. Typically, you'd get to about, you know, the 1,000 meter uh, mark or so and the vehicle would start moving backwards, and so you'd have to bring it down uh, in that case. And so again, that was one of the limitations that you had. Uh, and there were a couple of uh, um, you know, flyaways as well during these really high velocity regions where we had to essentially bring them down um, um, right near our operating area. And then next morning, we had low level clouds come through. Again, since we're required to operate under VMC, we can't fly through the clouds, so we have to maintain, again, a separation distance for that. Again, uh, does limit where we're at. Now this is obviously of great interest to us. We'd really love to be able to fly 
um, some sensors within these clouds to be able to get uh, cloud physics data. We're currently working on those now, but we haven't been able to get permission to be able to do those operations. Uh, even, if, even if you have special clearance, you can't walk in the clouds. Well, it, it actually depends. So I won't be talking about any of our operations that we've uh, performed under special use airspace, uh, but they obviously have a lot greater control over the airspace than the FAA does. And so most of those um, you know, observations, we've tried to piggyback measurement systems uh, on those, but none of, them was, no, none of those have been um, cloud-related at this time. Okay? But you will notice you know, this was a... Uh, a really nice capability for us to show that we could do this over a 24-hour period, that we could actually get a continuous set of data, even though it wasn't up to the altitude that we really wanted to get it to uh, in that case. And I'll come back and circle back around uh, uh, to that later. Okay. Um, so uh, with this, uh, I'll talk a little bit about the, the lapse rate uh, uh, campaign, uh, which was uh, CloudMap uh, joined last summer as part of it, our annual campaign. Kind of a similar set of operating conditions, although we had uh, larger sets of swarms of aircraft, which I'll talk a little bit about as well. Uh, and lapse rate um, was organized uh, uh, by Heist uh, DeBoer as part of the SARA meeting, which was held here at UC Boulder uh, last summer. Uh, so this ping pongs back and forth uh, between Europe and, and the U.S. every year uh, this summer. It's going to be uh, in Spain. Uh, but you'll notice, uh, for those of you familiar with this region, this is the San Luis Valley, uh, so near Alamosa, uh, down here, uh, kind of the, the southern end. And all of these um, symbols here denote different sites for each one of the teams. So the goal was to be able to take a coordinated and concentrated set of UAVs and operate them throughout the entire week through this valley and to be able to develop a really rich data set that we could then use for uh, simulations. Um, so I won't run through all the details, but again, we had you know, capabilities for some vehicles uh, to fly up to 3,000 feet, some vehicles being able to fly in limited swarms. We had a huge number of different platforms and number of different flights that we were able to uh, accomplish by the, the end of the week. We really had three things that we were looking at. One of those was convection initiation. Uh, so we had two days set aside for convection initiation tests, uh, two days for boundary layer evolution uh, flights, and then one day for a cold air drainage flight way up here within the Sawash Valley. Um, so you know, every team essentially had uh, a location that they were assigned to to be able to operate from uh, during a coordinated set of uh, flight periods. So this is an example. This is one of James's um, uh, simulations, and this was actually part of the entire week. So we used these predictions, these forecasts, to be able to determine what day was best for uh, which physics campaign that we were uh, essentially interested in. Is it a good CI day? Is it a good BL uh, transition day? A good cold uh, pool drainage uh, a day? And this is an example of one of those cold pool drainage cases here. Um, so the Sawash Valley uh, up in here and then the, the flow coming out uh, in the morning. Uh, so what we're able to come out of this, and James, is, you know, this was uh, run through last July, we're still in the process of pulling out all of our data, doing quality control checks on them, and then sending them uh, to James's group to run through simulations to see how well those will actually uh, uh, compare. So this is an example of the one, uh, he was actually just working on this yesterday, uh, feeding profile data, and what you'll notice for this particular site, this was located right around here uh, on that day, I'm sorry, up here on, uh, on that day, uh, doing profiles, and you'll notice you have this nice inversion that's set up in the morning, uh, transitions to you know a really nice uh, uh, linear model uh, later uh, in the day, and how well that compares to the evolution from the uh, um, the Wharf LES models. Um, the winds are pretty light and variable, so you can see they're kind of all over the map um, in this particular case. So. From this, we end up with a whole a bunch of driving questions, right? And one of these is probably, um, you know, the foremost is how to best deploy unmanned aircraft systems to really obtain useful observations, okay? And this lapse rate really kind of demonstrated this. You know, it's not that useful to be able to uh, uh, deploy a single vehicle, so what we really need to be able to do is deploy these in, you know, large swarms, uh, send lots of vehicles out. And so this starts to raise a whole host of other questions, which is, well, how many do you need? How far apart? 
uh, how adaptive to changing conditions. Assuming you already have all those other questions answered in terms of what sensors you're going to put on board, how confident are you uh, in the biases that you're getting off of those sensors. Well, the first thing you have to answer um, in terms of operating a swarm of aircraft, when we talk about swarm, uh, it is a coordinated set of aircraft. Rather than having individual aircraft out operating in, in solo, um, these are now coordinated with one another. So we do have some mechanism, typically through a ground control station, a computer on the ground, that is not only tracking where all the aircraft are, uh, but also you know, telling them where they need to be going. Um, up until recently, we were limited by the FAA under the Part 107 of the COA Ops in the national airspace to have one pilot and one vehicle. So even if you were able to go through the process and you know, have your swarm set up uh, through a, um, a ground control station, you still had to have a pilot with not only eyes on the vehicle, uh, but also a controller in case they needed to take control. And this again kind of goes back to where we're at in terms of the operating uh, requirements or capabilities of these systems. Uh, you'll notice Victoria here and some of our other students uh, flying the vehicles, they aren't really doing anything with these other than just standing there, right? All the vehicles are being controlled by a computer. They're flying through their autopilot on board, performing their profiles, you know, recording their data, and then flying back down, but still required to go through this process to make sure that everything um, is, a, is kosher. Well, we've actually come a, a, a pretty far since we've uh, uh, started this project back in 2015, where we had um, one pilot, one vehicle, and moved to multiple, multiple pilots, multiple vehicles, both with the rotary wing and then with fixed wing, and then finally last year, uh, one pilot to many vehicles, where one pilot is controlling essentially a swarm of vehicles up to higher altitudes, first 3,000 feet, and as recently uh, as last year, 6,000 feet in some select uh, sites. Our next goal now, this requirement that we're still under by the FAA, is to maintain a visual line of sight with the vehicles. So we still have to have people on the ground, not necessarily the pilot, but perhaps a visual observer being able to see where that aircraft is at. And that's not really to see where these aircraft are, but it is to make sure that if another manned aircraft enters the airspace, that you're able to bring your UAV down safely. Uh, so that way you're not uh, endangering uh, the manned aircraft. So the next goal then is to operate within beyond visual line of sight, uh, which we're able to do now in terms of having a pilot uh, located at a far distance away from the vehicle. So he or she cannot see the vehicle, uh, but we have a visual observer in the space now monitoring. So just this will just provi provide some examples of kind of the evolution of this uh, over uh, the past few years. So this was an early test showing a coordinated uh, flight between two fixed wing vehicles and one rotary wing vehicle doing a profile. Again, each independently controlled uh, by a pilot, even though they're going through their automated flight profiles. Um, so with the uh, University of Kentucky and uh, University of Oklahoma vehicle here, you know, shows that it was possible to go through these uh, uh, coordinated uh, maneuvers. Um, and so the, uh, the OSU team then demonstrated this with a coordinated set of five vehicles. Again, all operated under computer control. Essentially hit a key on your keyboard, have all the vehicles fly under a leader follower uh, a type of algorithm. Um, essentially in this case, they're all gonna line up. Um, like they would wait for a passing front to move through so that way you could do measurements of how that front, uh, front may change locally and then come back and land. But again, with the requirement that we have, you know, each vehicle being controlled by an individual pilot, which again puts a large logistical hurdle on actually going out and taking measurements uh, with these systems. So this leads to a little bit of discussion on the autonomy side. I don't want to get into uh, this uh, too deep, uh, but we essentially have two paths or two axes that we can move along when we start talking about uh, autonomy. One of those is the degree of autonomy. That means how independent is each one of these vehicles when they're out flying. And then the other is the scalability. Because uh, our goal is to be able to have dozens of these vehicles flying out in a region so that way you can provide a lot of data points um, you know, for a given phenomena or target that you're after. So that really requires that we're up here on this side uh, of the axis 
Uh, and if we want to have those uh, collaborate with each other, then we have to make them really you know, completely autonomous, but still communicating. So that way each vehicle knows where other vehicles are at um, in real time to be able to do this. And so you can see this here, um, you know, in terms of essentially taking these vehicles, putting, putting flight controllers on top of them, and then having them go throughout their, their motions. Now we first demonstrated this again in one of our summer flight campaigns. So these are vehicles controlled by one team here, and you'll also notice there's another vehicle flying just to take the video from these. And so you can see a pair of those vehicles flying along their coordinated flight path, and then we'll have another vehicle um, from one of the other teams coordinate with this uh, as well. And so you're getting you know, the data from each one of these, uh, which you can then post process and be able to compare with one another to be able to provide that you know, really kind of a vast data set uh, within the ABL. And so again, this was pretty limited you know, at, at that time. So uh, this was not what we'd consider a swarm in terms of all these systems being able to, to operate um, independently one another, but collaboratively um, within that coordinated uh, type of flight path. So this leads to another topic, which is, well, what do we really want the systems to do? We really want them to be able to um, you know, make decisions for themselves as they're flying within the atmosphere in order to be able to optimize the measurements that they're taking, essentially fly towards a target. And kind of the easiest example that we give for this is, you know, doing a, a methane plume tests, uh, being able to find the source of that, that plume leak. You want to be able to have the vehicles determine on the fly where the gradients are at and be able to essentially track themselves back to that particular source and do this in a coordinated fashion by communicating with all the other vehicles. So at the same time we're doing this is we're trying to figure out you know, what those optimal sampling scales are. How close do we really need the vehicles to be you know, when we're operating um, under a particular phenomena? So this has led us to a number of statistical analysis, uh, primarily using semioviriograms, um, to be able to look at the autocorrelation that we're getting between two different data sets uh, from different vehicles operating at different links. And so this has been one of our PhD students, Ben Hemingway, uh, working on this particular project, flying different profiles, different distances between the vehicles, comparing those measurements to be able to determine where you start to have correlation between those uh, signals. Yes? What's a semi-variogram? So again, it's this uh, analysis where essentially we're doing an autocorrelation uh, between the, the data that we're getting off of one vehicle with the data off another vehicle. Essentially, in, in essence, it's a way of looking at where do those two data sets start to line up with one another. And it's particularly useful when we start to think about this from the turbulence uh, uh, standpoint is the size of the, of the eddies uh, that we're in. Again, traditionally, uh, these vehicles that we're talking about are much smaller you know, than the, the typical link scales that, that we're concerned about from a modeling standpoint. And so this really starts to pull out some of those details for each one of those. So how does that differ from an autocorrelation function? Uh, well, it's actually similar, just a slightly different uh, definition. So based upon the, the statistical data that we're getting for each one of those. But it's very similar to an autocorrelation. Okay. Uh, so this then provides us lots of examples, you know, for us to go through. Um, and now we have the systems where it can actually uh, fly in real time and then start to track and control their positions based upon the measurements that they're getting from each one of the data sets. And this is just a, an example of one of those. Again, pretty limited. Uh, this is essentially map, mapping out uh, temperature variations to be able to you know, fly to a certain uh, um, value of uh, temperature within their search pattern. Now, our goal with this is to essentially be able to do something like this in the future, where you really now have a true swarm of uh, vehicles that are flying um, without any predetermined destination. So each one of these vehicles <coughs> know that it has to go to one of these spots, but it doesn't know which spot it's gonna to go to until it actually starts to get close and it determines that on the fly. Kind of like a game of musical chairs, right? You don't know which chair you're gonna sit in, but you determine that by the time that you get there. And this has been work that's been, uh, um, Jesse Hogue at University of Kentucky has been working on. So this is where we're at with the swarming systems right now. 
Um, so, you know, we've been able to demonstrate uh, this level of autonomy and technology, and now we're currently working on this system uh, with fixed wings. I know UC Boulder has also been doing this as well. This is not something that's certainly exclusive uh, to what we've been working on um, in, uh, in our program here. Um, so our short-term goal is to be able to do a set of 20 uh, over the summer and be able to you know, demonstrate that we can you know, really map out um, areas of that, uh, uh, that boundary layer. So to end up, uh, I want to show a couple of quick examples. You know, so I primarily talked about what the systems um, can do from a systems engineering standpoint, and, and the sensors on board uh, provide a couple of examples. This is one uh, that Victoria has been working on uh, for her master's thesis. Um, this is the Little Sahara uh, State Park uh, within uh, northern Oklahoma. Uh, for those of you who have been to the, the Great Sand Dunes, kind of very similar in structure to that, but not nearly uh, as large. Uh, each one of these is what, about 10, 15 meters high or so? Yeah, in terms of the height of these uh, these dunes, just to kind of give you a sense of scale. Uh, so her focus has been on both mapping these, you know, using uh, photogrammetry uh, techniques and then taking um, the sensors and diagnostics on board and looking at the uh, coupling between what's happening within the boundary layer themselves um, and then the terrain surrounding that. So to be able to perform those uh, boundary layer uh, measurements, conducting profiles, one vehicle essentially sitting upstream, you know, serving as a you know, virtual tower, uh, pulling that data off, and then comparing that with what's happening. You can see the separation region here unsteady um, down here in the bottom as the flow is coming over uh, this. Okay, and also looking at uh, the variability uh, in the winds. This is primarily, you know, looking at. Um, uh, southerly winds uh, throughout the year, you see a slow mig migration uh, of the sand dunes. And so this will be a long-term study for us to look at the impact of uh, uh, changing wind conditions and uh, climatology um, on these uh, particular dunes. And just to show you kind of the operational requirements for this, again, these are three vehicles, one f taking the, uh, the pretty pictures of the video, and then two actually taking the measurements, one sitting upstream, uh, taking wind uh, magnitude and direction, and then one performing uh, the profiles, taking the wind magnitude and direction as well. In each of these cases, just a, a 2D ultrasonic anemometers measuring at about 10 hertz or so. So uh, another example that we've been working on is uh, local severe storm uh, deployments, and this has been in coordination with our uh, local uh, National Weather Service office, uh, primarily as they're going through uh, interesting cases. Um, they'll give us a call and say, well, you know, we'd like to be able to get a profile within this area uh, to be able to put that in their models to see if it really changes the forecast or not. From their standpoint, they're interested uh, in an operational case you know, they're not using this for the forecast themselves, but just to see how much it actually affects the models, uh, both the a priori and then after the fact, to be able to come back and look at that data to see what worked and did not work in this case. So this is an example of a, a storm passing through. Uh, so you'll notice three profiles here, one uh, uh, pretty short in altitude, and again, that was due to the actual storm passing through. Uh, so we had to bring it down due to uh, uh, visibility conditions. We weren't able to see the vehicle within the rain, and then both uh, after the front uh, as it was passing through, send that data off to the National Weather Service office, and they run that through their models. And you can see, comparison-wise, this is a pretty small blip, right, on your uh, skew-t plot here. Uh, compared to what we get with the radio sonde, but it's also occurring, you know, within pretty interesting regions of the atmosphere, which may have a big impact on what's actually happening uh, through the model itself. Um, so uh, I know I'm ending up on my time here, so I want to end up with where we're going in the future. Um, so even though this current project is ending, so we're currently working on uh, future proposals uh, for uh, NSF. Next one of those is really kind of focused on uh, what we call precision meteorology, uh, really with the end goal in mind to be able to develop what we call the uh, 3D mesonet. Uh, capability to marry these vehicles uh, coupled with a ground tower. So now that you have a, an autonomous capability to launch the vehicles, either at regular intervals or on as needed uh, on command to be able to pro uh, probe that uh, ABL up to around 5,000 feet. 
uh, get that information and provide that directly back into uh, the weather model itself. Now, for this to actually happen, for this to really work, um, you have to do a lot of sensing with this. This is uh, one of OU's concepts that they developed around the, the radar uh, innovations lab, developing small, relatively inexpensive radar systems that can essentially see the environment around. Because we still have to be able to operate within those FAA purviews, meaning that if a general aviation aircraft flies through, we need to be able to safely avoid it without necessarily having a uh, pilot on board. So um, to end, um, all the data that we'll be collecting over the years will be stored on the cloud map site, so you know, you're welcome to come and check that out. Uh, we have reports on there um, right now that summarize our previous flight campaigns and systems development from all the different teams. And I'd like to end, you know, really thanking all the different team members that have been working on this project. This is just a few of those that were uh, heavily involved uh, over the past years and as part of that lab street campaign, both as part of CloudMap and for all the great volunteers, uh, both within Colorado and outside of Colorado, uh, UC Boulder and NOAA, uh, really organizing that uh, overall campaign, which is the largest deployment of uh, SUAS uh, that we know of at any time throughout the world, uh, and it really you know, focused on this uh, weather. So with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions if there are any. Thanks for your time. Yes. Yeah, like on this uh, picture, uh, I see this sonic anemometer up there, but it's right in the middle of the downline. It I'm is. Wondering what you're measuring. Yeah, and so that's that's a really good question, right? And so we had uh, we had a lot of skepticism about this, you know, in terms of well, what's this inflow really going to look like? And so first off, there is a bias, right? Each one of these rotors. Uh, it's a potential flow, you know, it's sucking flow in, and then, you know, we have a turbulent jet uh, on the back side or the bottom side of each one of these. Um, so the real question was, well, how accurate are your measurements really going to be from this? And surprisingly good. Uh, even though you have this inflow coming through, it's fairly constant and, and consistent, and through a number of validations that we've done, you're able to relatively easily back out that small bias that you get. And in larger wind scenarios, you almost have no impact whatsoever on the, uh, um, uh, the, the value of the wind velocity that you're actually measuring, so that truth value uh, that you get. So we've done these both in laboratory tests as well as you know, field uh, validation uh, exercises. The bigger impact is from the orientation that you do have to account for. Both, you know, this is a vehicle that as you have gusts move through will be reacting to the wind. So not only in terms of its attitude, um, you know, in steady state, but also, you know, changing in time. And so you have to count for that, the motion, um, along with the arm, since it tends to be mo moving about the center of gravity. So the question back here. So, so you're measuring winds, not turbulence. Well, so, you know, you can get the turbulence quantities out of these. These are report at 30 hertz. Yeah. Um, so, you know, you end up having a lot of unsteady measurements. But I'm not confident enough yet to say that we really are getting good turbulence measurements out of it. So I have to be really careful, um, you know, with what we're saying that we're getting out of that in terms of calibrating that. And that's primarily due to a limitation of our validation systems that we have. Uh, because most of the mesnets are reporting, you know, much lower... Uh, sampling rates than we're measuring with this system here. I know there's a question in the back too. Uh, that was my question. Sure. Yeah, but we're we're hopeful to be able to get there. And actually, our our goal is to be able to get rid of this completely, and just use the state vectors off the vehicle itself, right? If you have a really good understanding of what that uh, state uh, and that control system is on the vehicle you should be able to back out the wind velocities themselves completely. So that's what we'd like to be able to get to, so we have various groups that are working on that to hopefully achieve that. Has there been much in the way of validation using Tethershon systems? Uh, not, not from our group, but there are other groups that have been doing that. So primarily we've been using uh, towers uh, for most of our measurements, or sorry, validations. Yes? Have you looked into uh, like putting um, sampling ports horizontally out from uh... Yes, I don't think I have any pictures of those here, uh, but particularly uh, the, um, yeah, I don't think I have any of those, but the, uh, the UNL team uh, has been doing that, and has essentially extended them out uh, along both sides. 
and primarily for thermodynamic measurements, not wind measurements. What's UNL? Sorry, University of Nebraska. Oh, yeah, one of our partners. Sorry about that. What are, what are the range of um, types of uh, observations that you've been making? So you've talked a lot about just the basic PTU, um, but I know you've done some other. What does PTU stand for? Pressure, temperature, uh, humidity. Um, are there other measurements that you have been doing? Yeah, so um, C CO2, uh, methane, so, you know, lots of gas samplings, you know, and starting to look at the, the, the fluxes, uh, primarily eddy covariance measurements, uh, comparing with eddy covariance towers that are, you know, mounted on the ground. Uh, so this system here will typically fly uh, a LICOR system along with it, for those of you familiar with that, to be able to get that data. In that case, we do typically have a probe that goes out beyond the downwash so that we can sample out here rather than sampling, you know, nearby. Um, we still don't, you know, know if that's necessary or not, so we're still in the process of determining uh, that. Um, airborne LIDAR-based measurements as well, having LIDAR systems uh, on board. So, yeah, anything that you can think of that can be miniaturized, you know, you can eventually put on one of these vehicles, uh, assuming that you go through all the steps, you know, to be able to um, really calibrate and validate your system. Yes? Just curious, um for this particular example, what would be the synergy or perhaps advantage or disadvantages to just using a Doppler lighter, a commercial Doppler lighter? What can you do with this system? Or where does it fill in that the Doppler lighter wouldn't? Yeah, so so primarily, you know, you so you have command over the system, right? So it does give you a little bit more uh, spatial resolution. You're measuring at a point now. So that way you can start to look at uh, variations. I mean, comparisons with our LiDAR system, for example. Um, you're know, going up. So going back to this slide real quick. Um, I'm only showing the uh, the good data here. Uh, up to about, you know, 1,200 meters, you get really good measurements. About 1,200, you know, it's really, really noisy. Um, so we can fly above that and get measurements above that system. Um, it's also a lot less expensive in terms of, you know, operating this. You know, that entire system is going to be lower than a 10K price tag. And you can probably get that uh, a lot lower than that. So you can have a lot of units rather than just a single unit. Instant now, cost versus manpower, though? Probably. Well, yeah, it's a good point. Yeah, and so, you know, we're not there yet because right now you still have to have a pilot being able to do this. You know, but with the end goal in mind, you know, having these systems operate much more autonomously in the future. So that way you're sitting here in the lab pushing a button. It's out taking the measurements just like you would have a tower out taking the measurements. So you're not in the process of having to have that, you know, continuously manned by a person. Um, now, I'm not going to say your pros or cons is one better than the other. Not really. They're different, right? So you'll be able to use them for different things. Question? Well, so how much is your mezzanine station going to cost, though, as opposed to just dropping it off or light on the field? Yeah, that's a less, right? And so I can't tell you how much less yet. We're still trying to evaluate that. But based upon, you know, what a commercial Doppler LiDAR costs, it's still going to be lower than that. And primarily, that's just due to the really um, low costs that these systems, and I'll go back to this one. You know, this is, again, a, kind of a nice picture to kind of illustrate this. This is a larger high-end system that you have here. The vehicle itself is sub 5K, Right? And so you still have a lot of capabilities with this, and then putting the instrumentation on top of that, you know, you're sub 10K for everything that you see here, even once you start putting gas and uh, samplers on top of that. Um, so it's relatively inexpensive overall. Yeah, but you were talking about having a salometer in the mezzanine station as well as a radar system. Yeah, you still believe it or not, the, the cost is lower than having a Doppler LiDAR system. Yes. Do you know if there's any work being done with essentially miniature blimps? So there are, yeah. So aerostats have been used, uh, you know, quite a bit. Um, so that opens up a whole other uh, issue in terms of having tethered systems. The FAA is a lot less comfortable with a tethered system than it is a free uh, control well, system. How about untethered? Yeah, so untethered, then you're kind of at the mercy of the wind. So you're really limited about how, what you can operate in uh, within wind limitations. So typically... You know, anything, say, less than five meters a second becomes really, really difficult, or over five meters a second, I should say. Any other questions? Again, I really appreciate the uh, time and opportunity. You know, if we come back again in two years, we'll see where things are at. 
I'll have a better answer to your question uh, then. So. Oh, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Thank Jacob. You. Thank you. And, and for any of those that are interested, I mean, I'm happy to share these slides. Uh, so just let me know. You can just drop me an email.